and I think KKR, Blackstone, Brookfield, clearly, uh, they get paid to deploy capital. Uh, I think they, I don't think either one of those institutions cares about getting the exact bottom. I think they're looking at this right. as, hey, do we want to own these assets in five years? And if the answer right. is yes, they're doing the deal. Your own pal is speaking in Europe right now. We've already got a highlight of what his prepared remarks are. Essentially, Anna, we have a strong job market, at least really strong enough to give the Fed time. We also have a Fed that is almost on the cusp of declaring victory on inflation. I don't know where you st stand in all of this, but uh, apparently Jerome Powell, I would argue, is smiling. He feels like he's on the right trajectory. What says Anna Kelly? So overall, generally speaking, I like Jerome Powell. I, I do. Um, I, I don't pretend that he's perfect or the Fed has made great decisions or that they're even making what I the decision that I would make. Um, but I will say, you know, Jerome Powell is an attorney. He is not an economist like a lot of, you know, the others are. Um, and I, I know he said a lot of things about wanting to really break the zero bound, you know, yep. that he wants to to break the Fed foot of basically yep. Easily going back to 0% federal funds rate to have free money, which creates big asset bubbles and eventually big asset uh, bubble inflations or deep recessions. And so I think he's been on this path um, of really wanting to get to a place where, if possible, he could roll, you know, put enough pressure that the bad stuff kind of falls, right? That those that took too much risk, they would say, um, falls. And the other thing that he's talked about is really being concerned with the shadow banking system. And again, we talked about it briefly last uh, week when we spoke, but the shadow banking system is, is not this like, covert underground you know system of of monetary control like some conspiracy theorists might say it's essentially anything that's a non-bank financial yeah. institution they're not regulated the same way that banking institutions are and so there's a lot of loan transactions that have been done in the shadow banking system it existed before 2008 but especially the last several years, um, lenders who um, basically are doing all kinds of loans that wouldn't necessarily pass banking standards for loan quality. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Jerome Powell has been really concerned about a lot of bad loans being done at the peak, which are really the ones that could, could, could cause some systemic fallout similar to or even worse than if it all failed at the same time, the GFC. So we talked about that. If you didn't listen to that show, go back and listen to that last week. Um, but the point is, he has said that he really wants to break the bad behavior of bad loans that create systemic risk. And so I think personally that he has held off on cutting rates despite more weakness in unemployment than he is saying verbatim out loud. He wants to let the bad loans fail. He wants to create enough pain, in my opinion, um, to allow some of the fallout of the shadow banking system to wash away so that they can then come in and start regulating um, what they've tried to do, and it's never passed Congress completely, regulate the derivatives market, the shadow banking market, so that there is not as much systemic risk of, of you know, financial collapse. Mm -hmm. So do I agree with Powell? Not what he's saying publicly, but if you listen to insiders like Tom Honig, like Daniel DiMartino Booth, who used to work for the Dallas Fed, they talk about you know what Powell has said um, and the fact that he's really trying to do more than just fight inflation. If it was just fighting inflation, based on the fact that inflation really has come down in the vast majority of areas of inflation, the areas that the Fed can control, let's say that, and maybe that's another tangent we can go down. Um, but inflation is generally coming down pretty substantially, and there's substantial weakness in the job market and the employment market. I think he's kind of not quite highlighting that as much as he should, because he wants an excuse to hold rates higher for longer. Yeah. And and it has proved to, he, he's been right that there wasn't massive banking system collapse. And so he's held that line to say, how much collapse can we take? How many bankruptcies without it creating a banking crisis? And I think he's been successful in that so far. It doesn't mean that there's no more risk, but I think that what is clear that he is saying is inflation's coming down. 
Um, there is weakness in the job market. Employment's 4%. He still views it as stronger than what I think it really is. But I think that Powell Michael knows that unemployment is going to tick higher. We are going to mm -hmm. hit a recession. It's not going to be a soft landing, but all those things is what's going to do the last leg of bringing inflation down. And then right. they're going to win the fight against inflation. And then they're going to say, okay, we've beat inflation. Unemployment's tipped up a little higher than what we want it to. So let's start cutting rates and, and ease some of the employment issues that, that are a natural byproduct of the end of an economic cycle. That's what I think he's going to do. Yeah, I, th I love all of that because I actually have receipts. I think it was August 2022, Jackson Hole meeting. Rates were basically still at the floor is when he, he came out and gave that three or four minute speech that basically said free money's over. I'm going to kick you in the nuts if you're not ready for it. And he, sure did. he did, right? Jackson Hole two years, 2022. And I believe it. I believe his number one goal, to your point, is to break the Fed put. I, I talked about that two years ago. Yeah. And I think we are right on the cusp of him breaking it. So this is what I am thinking. So again, I don't see them doing anything in July. The data doesn't I warrant either. a cut in July. And today, I, for those that didn't hear what he said today, he basically alluded to that. He said, we're winning the fight. It's coming down, but we still need more data and more time to know it. And so yeah. that data is not going to happen in a month. You know, so yeah. I would be shocked at this point if they cut rates. But that's why you and I are saying this, because of what he Absolutely. said again today, reinforcing that it's not time just yet. When comes September. And I think September is we is when we find out if Jerome Powell stays true to his word of breaking the Fed put, because I am of the belief that the data will warrant a cut in September. That's what yes, I see. I coming, agree. Right. However, I am standing probably in a pretty narrow area that that has have said repeatedly that I think Jerome Powell is going to go one meeting longer than the data represents. Which means he'll go to November. And then I think what happens in November, because the data gets worse from there, they do a half a point in November. I still see that is a, I don't know, a probable path. And, and likely, in my opinion, but at least probable. Yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to take the easy way out, but I really think it's kind of 50 50 September or November. Right. So it, with. Yeah, all see, that's the, the point. If it is 50 50 and Jerome Powell wants to break the Fed put, he can't cut. That's the point, I think. Yeah, I think he can. He just won't do it 50. Ba if he did it in September, I would oh, bet be. money. If I were a betting woman, I'm not, but I would bet money that it'd be a quarter point that he sure. go, we're just going to cut it a little bit. Right. We're going to still ease off. We're going to get. And then after the election, they're meeting in November's after the election. It is. Then they would cut another 25 or 50 basis points. So, you know, but at the same time, you know, he has consistently said, and, and I, I believe him for the most part. Yeah. Um, I know they have they have pressure of being viewed from a political lens, no matter what they do. Um, if they do it in September, some people are going to say, you know, mm -hmm. he's giving it to the Dems. If they did in, in November, they're going to say he's giving it to the Republicans. You know, he's making it worse or better. Yeah. He has yep. said over and over. I'm not talking politics. I don't care yeah. about politics. We're going to do what the data says. And I think at this point, his legacy could be tarnished if he did anything different than what he said, which is, yes, I'm going to break agree. the Fed put. So I don't think he's going to come out in September or November and do a drastic cut unless and until, one, yeah. the Fed has declared a recession. Uh, not mm -hmm. the Fed, I'm sorry. The NBER has finally declared a recession. Um, you and I have both said we believe the recession started at the end of last year, that we're in it. I I would bet money that they won't declare it till after the election because the NBER doesn't want to be accused of looking political, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if it were declared, then they would cut. Um, yeah. And they would cut more drastically than a quarter point. Or you start to see mass layoffs between now and November, and, and it's so clear that GDP is low and that unemployment is ticking too high, then he can say, this is not a Fed put, but unemployment is going yeah. higher than we thought. And so therefore, we need to react because the data is telling us to do so. So it really depends. And, and one thing that I've learned through this time, and, and we've learned it before, we've been around a long time, is as soon as you think you know it, 
something <laughs> yeah. in the world changes I am. <laughs> that that shifts the paradigm and makes things not behave exactly the way that they have in the past, right? So look at real estate today. Um, real estate, yes, it's clearly been in a transaction recession. However, we did not have hyper supply, which usually is what leads to a real estate crash or recession in terms of transactions. So there's every recession and every financial crisis has a different cause and they look a little bit different. What I've learned through this one is that these long and variable lags, as Lacey Hunt likes to say, and, and some others, it doesn't mean that, oh, you got a three month or a six month lag and then everything happens. I mean, we've been through this for two years now um, and it's still not at the end of the cycle. Yeah. And so it's hard for me to make predictions and say I agree or I disagree between you know July and September or November yeah. because these things have taken so long because of all of the helicopter money in every yeah. segment of the economy um, has kept things more stable you know than they would have been otherwise even though that's also the cause of a lot of the inflation it also is preventing the you know the the fallout from being as bad as it can so. I yeah. know, I agree with you 100%. You know, employment is worse than Powell is saying it is. Um, recession risk is definitely much worse than Powell is saying it is. But he can't say that because he wants to hold rates as Correct. high as he can for as long as he can to yes. accomplish the greater, his greater mission, which is to, to make the entire financial system more stable so that if we have more inflation in the future, and I think he and he and you and I would agree that we probably will once we're it's through risk, the yeah. recession, um, mm -hmm. that the, the whole economy can handle higher future rates for longer and higher inflation means there needs to be higher interest rates. And he's trying to get that to where it's not as painful next time as it has been this time, in my opinion. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about here is, is commercial. I don't know if you've seen this, but black Blackstone was first Jonathan Gray. I think it was 90 days ago, then KKR last week. And now we have a deal between Starwood Baron, uh, billionaire Barry, as I call him, And um, who does Starwood sell Brookfield just did a, mm -hmm. a multi-billion dollar transaction. So I think what's happening, and this is just my opinion, the the top, the class A stuff is starting to trade. You're starting to see buyers and sellers come to an agreement. Yes. How, however, that's, I don't know what that is, 10% of the market. I still think this class B and class C stuff is, there is no trading. There is no selling. The buyers and sellers are miles apart. And we have all this, you know, a trillion in dollars in debt, you know, it's coming to reset. So I do think it's a good sign that the, you know, the class A stuff is starting to trade, but that yeah. doesn't mean we're out of the woods. And I, I would argue we're, we're just not even, I don't even know if we're starting with class B and class C yet. What do you see there? Yeah, I agree with you. And I actually did, believe it or not, I, I did a bunch of data studying on this when we started to have high inflation and I went, oh no, high inflation means higher cap rates, which means commercial values fall. I need to be really careful what I'm buying, what I'm developing, what I'm investing in, and be really careful for my investors as to how we start positioning the NOI to go up when the cap rate was going to go up and bring values down. Then we needed to do more to get the NOI up so that values kind of stabilize instead of just going you know, down as much as they did. So I did a bunch of research going back. I mean, I, I probably spent a month, Michael, just digging into historical data to say, what has historically happened to multifamily cap rates um, at periods of high inflation and periods of deep recession and financial crisis? And they behaved somewhat differently depending on the cause of the recession or the, so for example, in the dot-com bubble, um, in the 2019 manufacturing recession, you didn't see much of a change in cap rates for multifamily mm -hmm. investing. However, before the GFC, um, in the 80s, the savings and loan crisis between, you know, the 70s and all the way up to almost 1990, I mean, there was almost a 20-year period, um, and you go back to the 20s and 30s, cap rates were not really calculated the way they are today until about the 80s. Um, so the data is not perfect, but they've extrapolated something similar to a cap rate. And what we see is that after any major um, financial economic shift, a shift in the cycle where cap rates were low and then something happened in the economy, interest rates generally went up and that raised cap rates. And then you have a deep recession. 
although real estate leads the economic cycle. So it it just does. It it goes mm -hmm. higher faster than the rest of the economy and it comes down faster than the rest of the economy. What we see is that when the rest of the economy is kind of in a recession um, and it, it may or may not be deep, but the deeper it is, what's interesting is, yes, commercial interest, commercial loans go down in value fastest. And so that you see a big haircut on paper. But what happens is the class A real estate recovers more quickly. And sometimes, even while you're in a recession and your interest rates are, are a little higher because they haven't been slashed yet, class A multifamily values will start to come back and their cap rates will stay low. Because mm -hmm. and, and what it really is, is when you think of institutional investors, because you're talking about the big institutional oh, yeah. players big. that are trading yep. right now, they're not just looking at real estate as I like, I'm an operator of commercial real estate and I like it and now's the time to buy or sell what we do as an operator. They're not thinking as an operator or a small a small fish syndicator like myself or like Jonathan Twombly or you know even a Grant Cardone, right? They're big players. And what they do, Michael, is they say, given whatever's happening in the economy, what are my options for making a, a good risk uh, risk reward trade, right? A good re interest rate or return on my money for the risk inherent in that. And what mm -hmm. they, what you see is that they start comparing, do I invest in the U S treasury? Do I invest in triple a bonds? Do I invest in triple B bonds? Do I invest? Mm -hmm. And you go up the scale and a triple B bond is about equal to the risk return in most economies as a class, a multifamily property. Um, and then you start going up higher risk, which is like, okay, class a self-storage and class mm -hmm. a, office normally, but right now class A office is way riskier than a class B multifamily. So what they're doing and what they've done historically is they say, what else is going on in the world and the economy and where else could I put my money? In most recessions, commercial real estate has generally been stable. You usually have a place where you have um, more demand for housing than you do supply. Um, not always. It depends on you know the cycle and the location. The city is really important as well. But in big cities where where employers still come and and those big cities have good GDP, um, you usually tend to be undersupplied, which means you have a high need for renters during a recession. People lose their homes, they foreclose, so they rent, right? So even when the economy's in a recession, class A multifamily caters to people that won't buy or can't buy, but they have good incomes. So mm -hmm. class A is really generally very recession resilient unless you're in a market where there's just so much supply. And we do have that in parts of the country right now. But the point being, in almost every recession, class A multifamily recovers more quickly than a lot of other asset classes do. So the values start to come up, the cap rates start to come down, even in a higher interest rate environment for some for, for some time. But it does take a, about a year or so. And I don't have the data in front of me, so I can't give you the exact stat. Maybe I can on our next call. But class B starts to tick up as well, but it definitely takes more time. And the reason is because it's not the institutional investors right, with exactly. hundreds of millions of dollars of cash on the sidelines saying, we've liquidated everything. Now we're waiting for a good deal. Class A is only afforded by the mm -hmm. large funds, not the small syndicators, right? And they're Correct. happy, Michael, with the, a 6% return on their money in cash if they pay cash today, Versus if they bought it three years ago, they would have gotten a 4% return on their money. So yeah. when a treasury is, you know, in, in the 4.7 range, I haven't looked at it this week, but, you know, let's say four and a half to 4.7, generally speaking, they're going to want a six to 7% return for class A. And they're finding that in these yep. big trades right now. So class A, yes, it's starting. It's starting to recover. It's still going to take time. Oh yeah. These institutions also know though, Michael, that if cap rates don't come back down um, and and they if they do come back down, they're going to make a big win again. They're going to have a lot of equity. The values on paper are going to go up. But if it takes longer, or we have a lot of inflation come back after a recession. They know that they've got some risk there. So I think you're still being very careful and only mm -hmm. buying those deals that are distressed from a loan standpoint. 
in right. areas that are undersupplied. What you don't see is a lot of trading in cities that are oversupplied like Dallas. And hey, I was playing there, so I know the market pretty well. Um, but yes, it's starting. The the Class B and Class C stuff, I, I think it's going to take until we're on the other side of a recession into recovery which could be next year, you know, before we start seeing um, a lot more trading in the class B stuff. Class C is is only trading if it's extremely distressed. It was bought right. with bridge debt. Now tenants can't afford it. They can't pay. Their costs are up. Their rents, you know, are down. Their vacancies are high. So they've got a double whammy, class C. It's, it's the stress of the consumer that's living check to check at the same mm. time that cap rates are way up. Um, and, and that it makes there a lot more distress, but I can tell you the big players aren't the ones going to swoop in and do no. it. It's going to be the smaller, smaller players, but the deals still aren't good enough for the banks to sell them and for the, the risk reward, um, you know, dynamic that there is on pricing today. Yeah. I think, I, you know, the word to the audience watching this is we still got a long time to go through this. I think the class a stuff that is trading are likely from sellers who have quality assets, clearly, but they need cash for other parts of their business, right? Barry Sternlich, uh, over the last 18 months or so since Jackson Hole, he did clearly didn't get the message at Jackson Hole. He's had to for, he's had to shut down his mortgage company. He's had to stop you know paying on his REITs or whatever they are. Wow. He sold a single yeah. family home portfolio to raise cash. Now he's selling some other assets to raise cash. Uh, but again, there's buyers, and I think KKR, Blackstone, Brookfield, clearly. Uh, they get paid to deploy capital. Uh, I think they, I don't think either one of those institutions cares about getting the exact bottom. I think they're looking at this right. as, hey, do we want to own these assets in five years? And if the answer right. is yes, they're doing the deal. Absolutely. The the other thing, though, I, I, I just don't want to minimize the amount of distress that there is in Class A. So sometimes people think there isn't distress there because it's a brand new asset. But the reality is these con these were done with construction debt yep. and construction loans are only two to three years. So you've got you start the loan and you break your ground. That can take, you know, groundbreaking and prep of the ground and the septic and the sewer and the water. That can take a year before you even go from horizontal to what we call vertical. You're building the building. And then that can take a year, a year, year and a half, two years. And then you have a year to stabilize it. So mm. all these class A deals that were done were done with variable interest rate debt. You might lock in two or three years and then they're due. Right. Um, and so you have a lot of developers who are very good at what they do, but they got in at the wrong time where their rates are resetting before they have finished construction, um, before they have finished filling them up. And, and Class A often the struggle right now is because so many people move during COVID to big cities. And again, I'm going to pick on Dallas because I have assets there and understand the market. Um, Dallas is amazing. I mean, its GDP is extremely strong, much stronger than U.S. GDP. Tons of migration inward, tons of new huge companies opening um, businesses there for tax abatement reasons, et cetera. But the, the moving in, the inward migration has slowed. And so there was all this development preparing for this over the last three years. Well, now what's happening, Michael, is they're all coming online and, and trying to fill their units at the same time. And they're competing with five or six other complexes within two or three miles. What are they doing? They're having to slash their rents, give two or three months free just to get them filled. And so their, their income is down. They can't fill them up as quickly as they thought they could, and their loans are due. So there's still a lot of distress in Class A. It doesn't mean that that it won't be worth something in a couple years when all of those units that come online finally do get filled and we're on the other side of a recession. They're going to be great assets. So it, it, it kind of belabors the point, um, but just another nuance of it, that Class A these institutions are also only buying in big cities. So if you own something, and I'm going to pick on, I like to pick on Oklahoma City because Oklahoma City is a, a place that lots of syndicators went for yield. You know, they thought it's a tertiary type market, um, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been good because it's been way oversupplied for so many years. Average occupancy has been like 15 to 18% vacant average vacancy Ooh. rate versus like nine for the rest of the country. And so, you know, you've got markets like that where people bought hoping an institution would buy them out. They're not coming for you, right? They're mm. doing these deals in big cities that are big employment hubs. And that's why they're making the bet that those big cities bounce back. But if you're in a small market, you as a smaller um, operator, smaller syndicator, smaller investment, 
investor might have even more distress and more opportunity to go buy at better returns than maybe some of these big dogs can, if you can gather the funds and the investors to be able to take down those deals. I, yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think Ken McElroy is leading the charge. He's talking about buying a billion dollars over the next year or two. And a lot of it is this class A kind of construction debt, right? He happens yeah. to be, he can raise capital. He's an operator, owns a PM. And he's like, hey, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll pick up a 80% finished building, finish it, fill it up. So I think Ken is really leading from the front, showing all of us how the big boys do it, which I appreciate. But yeah, I think, I think for, I'm going to call myself a small guy, right? I'm not looking at anything more than 50 units. Um, I don't also, right. I don't want private capital, right? That's Olivia and I equity only. Um, yeah. So you're right. I, I, I'm licking my chops for 2025. I, I just think, you know, we're really early and it's, it's, it's just math at this point. It has to come. It's just math. Absolutely. And I think the most opportunity is between now and 2026, because most of the deals that were done with bridge debt or variable debt that absolutely is coming due um, were done, you know, 2021, 2022. Generally speaking, they're two to three year loans, sometimes with one or two one year extensions. So if you think about 2021 being when a lot of this stuff was done, you know, five years gets you to 2026. And so I believe rates will be way down, not back to the zero bound, but way down in 2026 versus, you know, even the beginning to mid of 2025, unless we have a really deep recession. Um, and, and so I think most of the distress on the sellers is happening between now and 2026. Um, by 2026, I think you've seen most of the fallout. There still will be some um, when, it, it, you know, if rates for some reason didn't really come down. But this is the time to do the work and to look for those distressed deals and maybe get a deal of a lifetime that you can hold on to for a long time. You just don't want to buy it with the, the thought that, you know, I'm going to own it for two years. I'm going to make the same mistakes they did and get, you know, short-term debt and hope to value add it and sell it in a couple of years. Because this recession could be deep and long. You could have a long recovery before you really get back to where, as a whole, multifamily has low cap rates and high values again. All righty, folks, I just want to give you fair warning. We are going to talk politics slash economics. We are going to mention people by name. If you do not want to have any political you know, nonsense in your head, feel free to stop the video now. All right. With that warning. I'm not going to go too uh, crazy. Don't stop. You can call us doomers or whatever you want to do. Magas when we're not, doomers when we're not, libs when we're not. You can call us whatever, but stay in and have a little fun. There you go. <laughs> well, I want to admit... You know, so I'm almost 52. I have never made an investment decision based on a presidential election. I've never even thought about changing an investment decision based on an wow. election. Wow. Right. It's just wow. it's never, never been a consideration, right? My time horizon, like kind of Warren Buffett was buy and hold forever. So yes. what does it matter? Right. That's it just didn't matter. I do think this election is interesting. Uh, for one reason, and I actually think it's going to create more opportunity, not less. Let me explain. I think we're to the point, right? We just had the first debate, you know, kind of the, the starting gun is off now, right? We have the conventions coming up. I think it's pretty clear, at least given the rules, as I understand them, who the, who the candidates are going to be, barring an outside force. And um, I think there's, you know, 30% of the world that hates one side and another 30% that hates the other side. And they're not changing no matter what, which uh -huh. leaves us 30 or 40% in the middle, which is where the election will be won or lost. Right. Right. And, and I think that means, I just think that means everything in the economy slows down. I've been on uh -huh. record the last week or so telling real estate agents, buckle up. I think it's going to get slow. I think you're going to have yeah. less lendings, less listings, less purchases. I think you're just going to have a lot of people, angry and emotional, all of that. And what that tells me as somebody who is an economist of the consumer, when that when the consumer is that agitated, they do nothing. They certainly don't yeah. do big expenses. Right. So right. I think the entire economy is, you know, you thought the first half, like I just looked at GDP now, they're forecasting Q2 GDP at 1.7%. That's with inflation at 2.8. So we're actually in real terms negative. 
Yeah. I think the second half of the year is going to be really slow uh, because of the election. Right. And then you get to yeah. the election. Oh, man, it's I am not looking forward to the next six months. So let's start it there. Yeah. So, yeah, generally speaking, I, I agree with you. And I, I, I think there's kind of two two paths here. One is. Um, have we do we make investment decisions based on what we think will happen in the election? I can say I never did in the past. However, um, I did make some different decisions about whether to 1031 exchange properties that ah, I chose to sell. That's fair. Or to take the capital gain hit and then find something different to buy and give myself a much longer time horizon to do it because of what I thought might happen to the capital gain rate depending on who got in. So for example, okay. um, and this is not hating on any administration or, or per particular person, but for example, Biden has been very outspoken about his goal. And it was in the Build Back Better plan, the tax plan that they tried to push through with that. They wanted to raise the capital gain um, extensively. I think it was 37%. Yep. Mm -hmm. 37.1, I think, yeah. States, yep. It would go to up to 43% of a capital gain for long-term capital gains. So the reality is the Democrats were in office. They did want that. And I thought, okay, if it passes, we are better off this year to sell, take the 10 or 15 or 20 percent long-term capital gain depending on you know your tax bracket and all of that and then you can go find something that gives you yeah. bonus depreciation well when bonus depreciation goes away if capital gains go up and there's no bonus depreciation you don't want to sell anything you want to hold mm -hmm. on as long as you can or do 1031 yep. exchanges so i have made decisions to hmm. buy or to sell and how to sell and to go ahead and take my capital gain on paper at the lowest rates in history um, and then that go buy sense. something with bonus depreciation. So I do think elections have consequences. So as investors, oh, we do have absolutely. to think about. And there's so many issues, right? We're not I'm not very black and white of you absolutely have to vote for one or the other for this issue alone. I think that there's lots of issues that we look at that. Um, if we're honest, we might say, you know, we're the 30 or 40 percent in the middle that see some issues that we like one side maybe better on, maybe others the other on. But as investors in general, I think um, elections have consequences to um, your interest rates, to what happens with taxation, to what happens with things like rent controls if we're a landlord. You know, if if, if um, there's legislation on the left side that says let's raise your taxes and cap rents. So national rent controls are on the table um, if you vote, you know, Democrat. And so as investors, you might go, OK, let's be in an area that's more conservative. And I do invest in conservative areas. And I even tell my liberal friends. And yes, I have liberal friends and I have liberal clients when I'm more conservative than they are. Um, I'm less conservative than some of my clients as well. But I say no matter what your personal politics you better be investing in areas that are landlord friendly, right? And that have low taxes in general and that have healthy economies. And so generally speaking, um, Republican-led cities tend to be more fiscally sound. Um, they tend to have lower taxes, but higher incomes and less crime, right? Look at San Francisco <laughs> um, versus maybe a you know a, another more conservative city. And so I think of I think of politics not purely from a financial standpoint, but as an investor, I do think if this party gets in, what are their goals? How is that going to impact me personally? Obviously, from the things I care about that are non-financial, how is it going to impact our community? And how is it going to impact my investing outcome? And therefore, I need to understand at least what are the platforms of both parties, not just look at the person. Because I think if we're honest, most people in America are saying, good Lord, aren't there better options than just the two that we have? Not everybody, right? I'm going to alienate some people because I don't like either candidate. I'll just say it. So, um, but we have to look at what's the platform. What mm -hmm. are go what things are going to happen if one gets into the other? Is there very much difference from a financial standpoint, from an economic standpoint? In some ways, the answer might be yes, but in some there there won't be. So I think it's important that we understand what's happening. But I do believe to the second point that you said that things are going to be slow. 
we have we're in this economy and we're in this political environment where there is so much gridlock we're kind of split down the middle and so it's very difficult for any one party to really push their agenda that's so opposite from the other on certain things um when both parties have you know basically this gridlock and i'm not going to work with them and i'm not going to budge you're not going to budge and not much gets done so if we have a congress that continues to be split michael regardless of who gets into the presidency you might not have a lot of legislation pushed through, at least for the first year while they're fighting over who should have won, who did win, whether they won, whether there's riots or, you know, good Lord, who knows what what might happen. God help us. But, you know, if there is as much um, craziness as there was after the last election and there's a lot of fighting there, it's going to be gridlock economically and nothing's going to change. And so you go through your recession that we believe we're in. You go through a very slow recovery and you have too much fighting to create anything that creates the next big boom and the big right. expansion that's going to create, you know, you know, big, big wealth and big incomes for a while. So I think we have to be patient and realistic that no matter how who gets in office, we might want to make some decisions if we think if we think that Biden's going to get in and that a lot of Democrats will be in Congress as an investor. If there's something, you know, you need to and want to sell, I would probably be selling it now to take advantage of the low capital gain. But other than that type of decision, um, you're not going to be extremely impacted one way or the other from a financial standpoint and opportunity. I don't think regardless of who gets into the presidency, I think it's more about Congress than it is the president. Yeah, this is this is fascinating to me because again, as I kind of open this conversation, I do think it's going to be slower. I think there will be people making decisions to essentially do nothing. But I also yeah. said in that opening that this is this is an opportunity. So what do I mean yeah. by that? I've been doing this long enough to know that in every cycle, every month, every quarter, every year, there are sometimes people that have to sell, and I mean have to sell. Yeah. And of all the deals I've done over 25 years, the best deals, the life-changing deals I've done were from people that had to sell. And let me be Absolutely. very clear. Sometimes that's price. Sometimes it's terms. I bought yes. a 14-unit portfolio. I think it was three houses, a triplex, and two fourplexes. I think that's 14. And we paid, we paid about market, maybe 100K less than market, so maybe 5% off. But we got 3% money. Yeah. Like 30 years, right? Yeah. He's going to have the note be part of his estate. Trust me, paying less, than, slightly less than market and getting, at the time, half of the market rate, easy cash flow. Why? Because he had to sell. He, he wanted to sell one time to one person. He didn't want to split them up, which he could have, but he was very late in life. And this was like, I need to get this done. You know, it's, it's this slower environment which I think has already started. And I think oh, it yeah. gets slower the closer we get. And to your point, if the country loses its mind again after the election, we could have a slow Q1, Q2 also. I'm I'm going to get greedy. I'm going to start writing lots and lots of disrespectful offers. I'm going to follow up just like I used to do every other week. And I don't, dude, I don't see, I don't need to do a lot. I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, KKR Blackstone, where I've got to push money around because I get paid on the on on what we put to work. I just need to do one or two great deals, and we just keep this party going. It's it's I I'm excited. I so for the country, yeah. I'm not excited. I think it's going to get right. harder from here. Yeah. But I've spent the last years telling everybody what I'm doing. We're set up fine financially, and I'm going to get a couple more great deals. That's kind of I'm kind of you know Jekyll and Hyde on that, I guess. Yeah, no, I agree with you there, though, Michael. And I, I think, you know, one thing that we've learned and we've talked about it and I, you know, I, I like Warren Buffett and I like a lot of things he says, but um, I mean, he's brilliant. He's made a lot of money and a lot of it's just been, you know, making a good deal for whatever environment you're in. You know, it's kind of like he's he's dollar cost averaging. You know, he just yeah. continues to invest in good companies that he has he thinks has wherewithal and then he he sits on it. You know, he's not gambling and doing the, you know, the day trading kind of thing, but he says, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. And, you know, we we've hit the peak of irrational exuberance for the most part, where we're clearly we've had the peak. We've had 
crazy money going after stupid stuff where people don't even understand what they're investing in, you know, memes and NFTs and things like that. Um, the, you know, the, the AMCs and all, all kinds of things. And so um, we, we've hit that peak of FOMO and irrational exuberance and people are starting to get scared. And, and you and I talked about again last week briefly um, that, you know, what happens when rates go down? You know, is it all of a sudden, um, you know, there's tons of supply on the market? And I said, I don't I don't think so, because I think there's still so many people that have been rocked by four years, four and a half years of uncertainty and crazy things happening that they don't understand, um, you know, wars and inflation and their cost of living up 20 percent now layoffs and, you know, another election thing. And I think people get so numb to being numb that they just don't take action. And so we've already seen as transactions have crashed clearly in real estate, both commercial and residential, investors have left. Realtors have left, mortgage brokers have left. And so as an investor, I have much less competition today to take down the deals from those who are really motivated sellers and just have to sell. And so that's always going to be more opportunity for me when there's less competition and when there are sellers who are distressed. And so this is the time for us to go and say, who are the motivated sellers in the markets that I play in that I know? Like this is dangerous to do just to jump into a new market because you think they're motivated when you don't really know the market. So I love that you and I continually say, do the work, pick your market, know your market before you start making those stupid offers. But yep. if you can find the motivated sellers in the market in which you play, where you know what a good deal looks like, then you go to those motivated sellers and you, they don't have 10 people making yeah. offers the same day that you're competing with. They're sitting on the market 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, and still haven't mm -hmm. sold their property. So yeah. those are the motivated sellers where if you can come in, they may need a certain price just to get out from under their loan. But what if you can create that deal creatively, like you said, on terms? And that's my favorite way to do it. I just spoke at an event um, for real estate women, real estate investor in June, and we talked all about creative deal structure. How can you create a win-win for you and the seller who's in distress? Figure out, ask them, what is your problem? What do you need out of a sale? What does a good deal look like to you? And why do you think you haven't been able to sell it? And then after you hear their feedback, you come in and say, okay, let me figure out a structure that would work for you. Maybe I can't get you your price, but I can get you a good income. Or maybe I can hit your price, but in order to do that, I need you to take, you know, do it at 0% interest and I'll pay you a big down payment to get you out of your divorce yep. or whatever your situation is. And then I'll make you payments and eventually I'll refinance you out. So this is the time we have less competition. You have more motivated sellers. It's it's the exact formula you want as an investor. And it doesn't come along that often that we see it. So we haven't seen that kind of distress really since right after COVID, but more so you know, during the GFC. So just like you and I bought a lot of distressed properties after the GFC and we rode the next 10 to 15 years and made a lot of money, we have the opportunity to do that again, which could be very yep. much once in a lifetime if you're willing to take action when everybody else is afraid and tells you that you're an idiot for buying real estate right now. Yeah, I can't wait. Do me a favor, Anna, where can people find you? You can find me here almost every week. I'm going to be traveling overseas for a couple of weeks, so I'll miss a couple shows, but I have a playlist on your channel. Um, you can find me at social media at Anna Kelly, REI Mom. And if you're looking for real estate coaching, consulting, deal review, looking at PPMs, anything of that nature, you can find me at AnnaKellyInvesting.com. Anna, have an amazing trip. I love that you're getting out and uh, seeing the world. Take care. Thank you.